Our, our next speaker has like a few very interesting things going on. Recently became half certified for scuba. That honestly makes me a little nervous. We'll talk about that later. May need to hang out with Dan Chen a little bit. He, he's a rescue diver, you know. And wait, wait, wait. And then you need to hear your walk on music. And then you recently learned how to, she learned how to make memes about a month ago, and she's now drunk with power. <laughs> so everyone, please welcome Sarah. Okay, folks. So uh, I'm Sarah Catanzaro. I'm a general partner at Amplify Partners. Uh, which does mean that I'm a venture capitalist, not a meme designer. Uh, I focus on investing in technical tools and platforms, most specifically data and ML tools and platforms, uh, but I used to be a data scientist. I most recently led the data team at a company called Mattermark. Um, so as a former data scientist and a current investor, like I ought to be good at predicting things, but I wasn't. Uh, my predictions about industry adoption of machine learning, like they were very wrong. Uh, ML-driven product development, like the pace of it has been just much, much slower uh, than I anticipated. And so many, so many data and ML teams, like, they're still saddled with the exact same problems. These are problems that uh, Josh Wills, uh, who was the director of data engineering at Slack, uh, described in his talk back in 2016 about the infinite loop of data sadness. So um, as a VC, like, Another thing that I've learned is that like, it's, never, it's never me. It's always you that's the problem. Um, so maybe like, I'm not bad at predicting things. Like, you're just bad at learning things. Hey, Wes, there might even be a photo of you in here. Um, so so like, over the past couple of years, like, so many early data scientists, like people from uh, Facebook and, and like LinkedIn and, and Cloudera and Netflix, like, they've actually shared a lot about the lessons that they learned building early data science products. They, they, they've given talks on, on you know, building ML teams and streamlining processes and implementing technical stacks. Um, but those lessons have been largely ignored. So, for example, like back in 2017, Monica Rigotti, she, she wrote this blog post on the data science hierarchy of needs. And she presents this, this set of guidelines for implementing the foundations that are necessary to uh, really benefit from data science and ML. Um, so, so for some additional context, Monica is now like an AIML advisor. She works with companies ranging from early stage startups to uh, Fortune 500 enterprises. She, she used to be the head of data at Jawbone and had been an early data scientist at LinkedIn. So, so she's drawing from like a real well of experience as she writes this post. At end, like it is gold. I, I swear, like, if every data team actually, like, followed her advice, we would have, we would have, like, flying, invisible autonomous vehicles. We would, we would have, like, uh, perhaps, like, headsets that, that connected to the right device when you started a Zoom call or, or <laughs> um, like, these things that actually work. Um, but we don't. So... Today, what I want to do is actually revisit the guidelines that she shared um, and use these guidelines as a framework to really evaluate where we've made progress in defining ML stacks and best practices and where we perhaps need to course correct. So I will start at the bottom of her blog post. Um, Monica concludes by saying that the Data science hierarchy of needs is not an excuse to build disconnected, over-engineered infrastructure for a year. Um, I'd ask you to raise your hands if you have built disconnected, over-engineered infrastructure, um, but I don't want to you know, overwhelm the room with hand raises. Uh, so many teams have done this. So, so like, how do you avoid it? 
uh, frankly, I think like what more teams need is explicit, specific goals for their ML platforms and goals that they're going to measure and track. Uh, so for example, your goal might be to ship higher quality ML driven software products faster, in which case you could track things like iteration speed, you could track things like number of bugs or like the time to bug resolution. But like we're all data practitioners, we ought to be using data to uh, track the impact of the tools and platforms that we use. So with that out of the way, let's start at the bottom of the pyramid. Here we have uh, data collection. Um, obviously, to implement data science and ML projects, you need data. Uh, that could be like logs or events or, or user-generated content or, or sensor data. Um, no matter what it is, like we're pretty bad at this. That's why I gave it a D. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else here is actually from San Francisco, but you, you might have like heard of the Millennium Tower. So, so it's like this, this luxury high-rise building, a like multi-million dollar project uh, that happened in the city. But they built this tower on top of like soft soil and landfill, so it's sinking. And that's effectively like what we are doing with data science and ML stacks today. Like we are building ML stacks on top of crap. Pardon my French, I hope you can like you know, blurp that out. Um, or, or, you know, as we affectionately call it, like digital exhaust. And, and our ML stacks are sinking. So what's going on here? You know, I think one of the, the kind of more problematic behaviors that I see is that Data science and ML teams, they, they start prototyping their models by looking only at what data is available and accessible to them. And, and while we certainly want to use the data that we have, we ought to also consider what we could and should collect. So, so why aren't data teams doing this? Well, first of all, you know, it certainly requires us to really thoroughly understand uh, how users interact with applications and to understand application behavior. But I think the thing that is probably you know, scarier is that it perhaps requires collaboration. It requires collaboration with product engineering teams uh, who are often implementing this instrumentation. But if you do collaborate with those product engineering teams, you can do things like implement ingestion services uh, that collect data with a schema that is actually well suited for your needs. You can do things like adopt uh, tracking plans or like unified log formats or, or event validation systems that will not just help you collect you know, the right data, but also ensure that certain data quality uh, qualifications, if you will, are imposed upon that data. Um, what's more, like if you are uh, working with external data, if you are acquiring data from vendors, then like perhaps collaborate with like your legal and finance team to streamline data acquisition processes. This is going to make like onboarding new data sets just so much easier. So I don't want to seem like too fire and brimstone as I go through this. Like there are a lot of data teams that are doing super solid, amazing work. There are also a lot of people who are working on projects to solve some of these problems. I'm not actually going to go through all of these things today, um, but I'll put the slides online and you can peruse these projects whenever you have time. Okay, so the next thing is moving in store. Um, this would be uh, tools and platforms that enable teams to uh, collect data from like SaaS applications, other applications, uh, transmit it to a data lake or a data warehouse um, where it will be stored for downstream consumption. And the good news is that like we've actually made a lot of progress here. Um, there are all of these new like ELT tools that help you transmit data from SaaS platforms and from your like product applications 
uh, into the, the data warehouse or, or data lake, things like Meltano and Airbyte and uh, Fivetran, those are great. Uh, what's more, there's a whole new set of tools like Dagster or Prefect or Astronomer uh, that really address some of the underlying limitations of, of Airflow and make it so much easier to orchestrate complex data workflows at scale. Um, I'm also really encouraged by the fact that like companies are finally adopting tools to test and document and monitor their data pipelines. Um, and some are even using tools to understand data lineage uh, so that they can detect the impact of data pipeline issues on downstream services. But I, I gave you know, this level a B because like, there's this other really nefarious pattern that I see where companies are effectively like building two data stacks. They're, they're adopting two systems of record and building stacks upon each. So, so often I see analytics teams that are adopting a SQL uh, database or they're adopting a data warehouse that is optimized for SQL workloads. Uh, and working with structured data, while the ML teams are adopting a data lake that is better suited for working with uh, both structured and unstructured data. Um, in fact, earlier this week, I was talking to uh, the head of ML at like a Fortune 500-ish company, you know, one of these like multi-billion dollar public companies who is opining about like some data governance issues. I asked like, oh, have you considered adopting a data lake? And he's like, no, nah, I don't think so. Later that day, I was talking to somebody on the big query team and they're like, no, nah, that company is one of our like biggest users. So if your data science team doesn't know that you have a data warehouse, that's probably problematic. Um, but there, there is like a whole set of tools, many of which have actually come out in the past year that help rectify this issue, either by integrating the, the data warehouse and data lake, you know, helping you sync models from the data warehouse into the data lake, or by providing like one substrate that uh, is well suited to both data science and uh, analytics workflows. You can check those things out. All right, moving on, uh, we have the explore transform level. This is primarily tools to clean and prepare and like manage the quality of collected data. Um, as, I, as I had said before, like over the past couple of years, uh, with the adoption of, of you know, data warehouses and data lakes and the implementation of ELT uh, platforms, like companies, they're, they're storing more data than ever before. Uh, but most of this data was not collected uh, for data science and ML use cases. So, so data scientists, they, they, they need to spend so much time manipulating and refining that data until like it is okay enough to use. And uh, because this is so tedious, I think like many data practitioners have just adapted, they've, they, they've built tools or they've adopted tools uh, that make the process of, of data preparation like a little bit less painful. Uh, you know, tools like DBT, uh, the implementation of like analytics engineering best practice, like uh, it's making it a lot easier to build like core data models. You have things like Datafold uh, that help you prevent uh, data quality issues when you're making changes to data pipelines or, or um, your data models, uh, tools like Monte Carlo, uh, those help detect data quality issues by modeling the distribution um, so that you're able to uh, you know, gain an awareness of, of when the distribution shifts and things like that. And like these things are all great. Um, but at the end of the day, like we need to lean way too heavily on this set of tools for data preparation because like we are not being more careful about data collection and collecting data that is kind of purpose built for modeling and analysis. So you know, as Pete recommends, like next time you're like, 
uh, toying around with an ML model and it just won't work, like maybe ask a PM to add a text box somewhere. All right, now we are at the aggregate label uh, level moving on up. Um, here we primarily have like tools and platforms and workflows for, for transforming data into data products, whether it's like dashboards or reports or stories. Uh, Monica also puts like data labeling tools and uh, feature engineering tools at this level. I think it's kind of like the data abstraction level or something, or, or maybe she just needed somewhere to slot that in, I don't know. Um, okay, so we're still really bad at counting. Like, I, the, yeah, uh, I work with companies that are building data tools and platforms, so like, founders who are former data scientists, former engineers, and even they like struggle so much with, with KPI reporting. Um, earlier this morning, AWS actually released a blog post where they said that one of their customers was spending $6 trillion on RDS. Like $6 trillion on RDS. And the funny thing was that they reported that like this was an improvement after that customer had implemented a more optimal partitioning scheme. So even Amazon can't count. Um, so, so like, why why is counting hard? You know, I think I think it's often hard to work with disparate stakeholders uh, to really like figure out what to count to to identify your north star metrics. Um, and when you get there, like the work isn't done. You need to work with them to to kind of observe those metrics and like develop this collective understanding of how and why metrics fluctuate, and you know, if and when you can influence those metrics. Uh, another thing that I care pretty deeply about is that like, data scientists should be in the room where strategic decisions are being made. I can't tell you like, how many board meetings I've attended where like, if we just had more data, or if we just had somebody who could help us understand the data that was presented in context, we'd be able to like make better decisions or diagnose problems in a more rigorous way. So my hope is that like in the coming years, we will see more data scientists involved in board level conversations. Um, and lastly, you know, as data teams like, we ought to be using our North Star metrics too. We ought to be using these metrics when we think about prioritization, when we think about like the impact of the projects we're implementing. Um, the more fortunate news is that like we do have better tools for data storytelling and labeling and feature management, things like hacks and streamlet, where they really enable their stakeholders to synthesize qualitative and quantitative insights and uh, develop these data stories uh, that help decision makers uh, really understand the context underlying the data, um, but also like improve data literacy. Data labeling platforms, they're, they're no longer just providing access to labeling services. They often include tools to think about and uh, assess uh, data quality and feature management tools. Uh, they'll help you like deal with issues like online, offline inconsistencies or, or accurate backfill. Um, and increasingly, they're better integrated into, into data stocks too, so that's good. All right, almost there. Um, okay, so, so experimentation is like kind of having a renaissance. I, I feel like more and more companies are recognizing that growth doesn't happen by accident, that you need to test you know, more and more ideas to, to sustain growth. Um, more and more executives are seeing experimentation as a revenue driver, not a cost center, um, and are in support of deploying additional resources uh, to run more tests. Additionally, like there's a whole slew of tools, both open source and commercial for feature flagging and randomization, um, and some new ones too that actually do things like automate experiment analysis and help you implement uh, techniques like Cupid um, that'll, that'll like reduce experiment durations. Um, 
the not as great news is that like far fewer teams are actually using their experimentation platforms to assess their ML models. Um, one thing I am encouraged by though is that more and more ML leaders are like picking good problems. We're no longer treating AI as a silver bullet. So they're looking at either like rule-based systems that have become too gnarly or like crude models like an Excel spreadsheet um, and using ML to replace those and that's great. I think we've also kind of reined in the tendency to uh, use more complex models when a simple one will do. Um, but it hasn't been fully reined in, and I think one of the, the underlying issues is that like, it is still way too hard to iterate on models in production. If you don't know that you'll be able to easily replace your simple model with a more complex one, it's going to kind of like drive a tendency to over-engineer things. Uh, so that's not ideal. Um, but. Uh, why is it that it is hard to refine things in production? I, I think like it's scary because many companies don't actually have like tools to monitor their models in production, and if they do, they're looking at things like F1 scores, you know, precision and recall, not like the the uh, association between. Uh, model metrics or model performance and user experience. So, so we don't really understand the relationship between the model performance and like the, those KPIs that I talked about earlier. Um, a lot of the tools associated with experimentation, the tools associated with MLOps are also like disconnected. So it becomes harder and harder to uh, implement like incremental rollout strategies, whether it's like canary deployments or, or shadow deployments or things like that. And then lastly, you know, one of the things that I'm constantly uh, reminding people is that like when you develop a model, uh, you're often only developing like one component of a software application. Uh, you need to connect that model to other systems, whether it's like UI services or message buses or, or databases. Um, and if it's not easy to like swap in and out that component, then you end up with like these really brittle complex software systems that can easily break. But again, there are some tools that are helping to fix this. Uh, so you can check those out later. All right, we have made it to the top. So although you know the, these models are um, nearly impossible to like operationalize, uh, AI researchers have actually made like a ton of progress since Monica wrote that post back in 2017. I, I think it was about two months before she she published the post. Uh, researchers at Google Brain uh, released the first paper on the transformer architecture. And it turns out like maybe attention is all we need. Um, these models keep getting more powerful. They keep achieving state of the art performance, albeit on, on research benchmarks, as we add more parameters to them. And so like, I'm very hopeful that if we just implement the right foundations, we'll be able to really tap the potential of these transformer architectures. Okay. So TLDR, like collect better data, uh, d d just do it. Like it, it will make your life so much easier over a longer time horizon. Uh, think carefully about your North Star metrics, iterate on models in production. And I guess, you know, lastly, like this is, it's, it's a pyramid, it's not a shopping list. Like these components, they need to be well integrated. They ought to work together. Um, Collaboration is key, and listen to your elders. We've been doing this for a while. Okay, I'll see you later. Thank you.